13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age This week on 13 Questions, we're going to be chatting to our first doctor, Dr. Mike Hart. A uh, great guy down in, he's a fellow Canadian over in uh, Ontario, really doing the Lord's work and working with um, cannabis in his practice. And he works with nutrition and all the stuff that regular doctors don't seem to care about. Um, but yeah, we uh, he's a big nutrition guy. He's okay with cannabis. He's anti, not anti, but he's very slow to get into um, pharmaceuticals whenever possible and look to the more holistic approach whenever there is one. There's a great guy to chat with. We welcome anyone from Dr. Mike's community who may be rolled over to check out this chat. Welcome aboard. Of course, uh, we do these free podcasts every twice a week where you get uh, the 13 questions and uh, twice a week. Of course, if you do head over to 13questionspodcast.com, head over to the sign up page and sign up. You do get the extensions to the two podcasts as, podcasts as well. So in addition to the 13 questions, you're going to get the five to eight bonus questions. And then the little wrap up we do at the end of these things that could go anywhere from 10 to 45 minutes, where it's sort of just open conversation style, less scripted. And they're great. The bonus interviews have been great. Like we say, it's the two, two a week. So you get, you know, two extensions a week. You're also going to get a weekly newsletter from our staff with some journaling prompts aimed at self-discovery, maybe some growth, some self-improvement, if you so see fit. Any bon bonus podcasts we're releasing at that time. Exclusive content from our affiliates. Right now we've got TJ Walker's communication courses, five of them, uh, totaling you know well over 100 hours of content there. They're all based on communication which is a great thing for humans to be better at. Everything seems to boil down to communication. Everything boils I mean, down really, to communication. Like in business and personal Every, lives business, and everything. Business, personal, I mean, friendship, like, intimate relationships, yeah. parenting. It's yeah. all communication. Yeah. The better you get at communication, the happier you'll be. So yeah, we got those. I mean, those right there are worth, you know, a year or two, the price of admission for a year or two at the website, which is about seven bucks a month. Um, so right there, you get instant value. You get access to the live private Discord chat room, which is members only and private forums, which uh, adds a little insulation from trolls or, you know, gives us some place we can build some real community where everyone we know is a member and committed to the to to growth and being a better person. Exactly. And probably the, the best thing we got going on. Oh, and the other thing is we're going to, I mean, the plan for the discords and stuff like that is that when you get in there, you know, we're going to have some, a bunch of people in there and it should take on its own sort of life with some people that like Graham that have been through addiction struggles that now, you know, all of a sudden you can find some people that have maybe been through or are going through things that are similar to where you're at in life. And you guys can just talk it out, you know, maybe it's advice, maybe it's just venting, maybe it's, it's whatever, but yeah. you know, we we're all, it's all, it, there's a lot more similarity in what everyone's going through than, than you think. Yeah, totally. So and, it, course, and it's good to always look for the similarities and the differences. In fact, that's like a cliche in the recovery community that we should go in looking for those. You know, if you go in looking for the differences, you're just going to be justifying and rationalizing your way out of it all, right? Instead mm -hmm. of looking for, oh, look at the similarities and what he's done to help others or help himself. That'd be good advice for the whole planet right yeah. now, at least the West. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look for similarities, yeah, exactly. not differences. And of course, the main thing we got going on here for our members, or at least what I think is one of the big things, is the ability to record your own fathers, grandfathers, or other influential people in your life. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe, Maybe it's, it's a group friend. of friends, you know? Yeah. Maybe it's a bunch of people you play uh, games with or something. Yeah. Or, you know, guys you play hockey with. Like, just... Maybe it's your pastor. Yeah. Something like that. Whoever it is, um, basically, you record the interview since we've got the questions and the bonus questions. If you don't know them, we should post those somewhere, I guess. We should have, actually, they're in the forum. So if you're a member, you've got access to all the questions that are posted in the forum. The bonus questions are in the forum. Grab those, go record your grandpa, send us the audio. We'll edit it up. Bam, grandpa's on the internet for the rest of time um, with his answers and his insight to the world. Um, I think uh, 
And hopefully, my hope is that some of these open source style interviews are going to turn out to be some of our best ones. Yeah. Oh, they will. Yeah. Yeah. And you never know who's getting, who you'll get. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to hearing your grandpa. So go sign up today, 13questionspodcast.com. Uh, sign up. Yeah. What are you waiting for? So Dr. Mike Hart was born in St. John's, Newfoundland. And from early beginnings, he participated in numerous athletic activities, including competitive ice hockey. At the age of 14, he was introduced to weight training and quickly developed a passion for both the sport as well as an affinity for helping people better themselves and feel better about themselves through the promotion of health and well-being. In September 2002, Mike began studying nutritional biochemistry at Memorial University and completed his degree in 2006. And after completing his undergraduate degree, he obtained his medical degree at Saba School of Medicine in the Netherlands, Antilles, from 2006 to 2010. And in 2010, Mike began his family medicine residency at the University of Western Ontario Schulich School of Medicine and completed the program in 2012. In addition to his strenuous ac academic training, Mike has persistently sought out the latest breakthroughs in nutrition and fitness literature and applied it to his knowledge and practice base. He is constantly in pursuit of becoming the fittest and healthiest person he can possibly be, and he feels that his passion can translate into better care for his patients. Dr. Hart believes that everyone has the ability to create an extraordinary life for themselves, and he is consistently reading the latest psychology to help improve the best mental health care for his patients. While he's not in the clinic, you can find him lifting weights at the gym, playing hockey, or kickboxing, and he is a diehard fan of UFC. Excellent. Excellent. He seems like a diehard fan of being a better person too. That's yep. for sure. Yep. And he's open to the cannabis, he's open to cannabis clinic as well. And he's, uh, you know, that's a big part of his, his process is, you know, helping people, you know, with harm reduction and, uh, maybe using this cannabis, uh, as an alternative to, you know, other things like prescription or harder drugs or alcohol, even, you know, he's a big proponent of sleeping right. And that things will, uh, you know, if you can get that right, a lot of other things will, will happen because of that. Absolutely. I recommend checking out his Twitter feed. It's very inspirational. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, guys. Sign up if you can. Become a member. Head over to 13questionspodcast.com. Most of all, enjoy these well-thought-out answers. They really make you think. And... uh enjoy him we thank dr mike for his time yeah he's a cannabis physician and a lifestyle strategist all right welcome to 13 questions we have Dr. Mike Hart. Uh, Mike is a London, Ontario-based physician. He specializes in post-traumatic stress. Uh, Dr. Hart works with veterans and others to help them overcome PTSD. Um, is there anything else uh, we should add to that, Mr. Hart? I think that's a perfect intro. So thanks so much for uh, doing that for me, Adam. Nice. Well, I pulled it from your website, so. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> All right. So you've had a chance to look over these questions. You uh, ready to dive in? Absolutely. Let's do it. Awesome. What was the best advice ever given to you? So the best advice I've ever read, uh, that's ever been given to me, um, something that I got from, uh, Joe Rogan, who I think is, you know, also, um, someone that a lot of your audience admires. Um, so he has this saying where he says, you know, be the hero of your own story. And I think that's perfect. Um, you know, everyone kind of feels that, you know, their situation is unique and, and different from others, but, you know, in reality, that's just not true. You know, there's definitely someone out there who's been in a situation, uh, just like yours, probably even worse and somehow, you know, made it out. And the way that they did that is they were the hero of their own story. You know, they examined, um, you know, what was wrong in their life and then they, uh, decided that you know they needed to make a change and then they made the appropriate changes and ultimately that's being the hero of your own story you know you you do for uh, yourself what you would do for someone else is there anything you would do to modify that for yourself today um, 
you know, the only thing that I would say is that in addition, you know, to becoming the hero of your own story, like your story is going to change and it's going to evolve. So, you know, don't think that uh, the strategies that you implement the first time are going to work the second time. You know, it's going to have, you're going to have to constantly, um, you know, upgrade that overall formula. So, um, you know, even if you do get it in the mindset of, you know, I'm never going to feel, <clears throat> I'm never going to feel sorry for myself. I'm always going to do, uh, you know, the best thing. Uh, possible the next thing uh, the best thing uh, necessary you know you're still going to have obstacles and you're still going to have uh, to come up with uh, new strategies to get around those those obstacles nice yeah. what was the most important lesson you learned from your parents this is a really good question and uh you know this is something that you know i didn't really learn growing up it's just something recently that um you know my mom uh said to me maybe maybe just three or four years ago. But um, I think it's really, really uh, important in, in today's society. So, you know, she said to me, she said, happiness is fleeting, but contentment is constant. And, you know, that really, really stuck with me because, you know, we're just inundated these days on social media with, you know, be happy, happiness is this, and, and all this di different type of stuff. And, you know, maybe I'm a little bit, um, you know, guilty of, of putting out some of that material myself in the past, but, you know, I've really gotten away from it because, you know, I do feel that my mother was right when she said that, you know, that, you know, happiness is a fleeting thing. You shouldn't really strive for happiness. Like if you're striving to be happy, I think you're doing it all wrong. You know, what you want to do is you want to strive for meaning and then through meaning um, and then through, you know, following your genuine intellectual curiosity, you know, happiness will just ensue as as a byproduct of that but if your intention is just to be happy you're not going to have any meaning in your life and paradoxically you're probably not going to be happy either but you know if you strive to have meaning um, then you have purpose in your life and you're just constantly content so you know things are, are a lot less likely to kind of throw you off base and you don't get upset if you if you aren't happy because um you know you understand that that's part of life you know, and, you know, happiness is just one of the seven human emotions that, that we experience. Um, and you shouldn't always just be striving just to, just to look for that uh, one, one particular emotion. You know, there are seven different human emotions. You are, are going to feel all of them. And you, know, you should just accept that instead of just trying to resist it and trying to just become happy all the time. No, that's awesome. That, it, that seems almost like a chunk of advice that's completely lost today when you look at the amount of people that are on antidepressants where it's staggering to, to think that there's that type of, you know, uh, systemic sorrow. Yeah. And I mean, I've, you know, there's lots of, um, you know, authors and stuff that I've read, like um, uh, Nassim Talib, the guy who wrote uh, Black Swan, like, you know, he said some of his best work he's done is when, you know, he's, he's been in states where he's been a little bit, uh, depressed because it's, you know, it's nailed him to look at things differently. Um, and because of that, you know, his work has come out better. Um, and other authors, you know, that I've met and, and I've talked to have, have said to me, you know, the, the exact same thing, because sometimes, you know, when you are in these agreeable states, um, you know, you're more likely to kind of say yes, maybe to things that you shouldn't say yes to, whereas say, if you're in more of a disagreeable state, um, you know, you're, you're less likely to kind of be naive. You're less likely to kind of say yes to things that maybe that you shouldn't say yes to. So, you know, I think that there's, um, there's positives and, and negatives of having different emotional states and we're, and we're supposed to experience all of them. And, you know, to, to tell yourself that you should be happy all the time, 24 seven, I mean, that is not a good thing to tell yourself for, for your overall mental health. And it's not, no. And I, and I love that. And not to hit on you being a physician, but I, I see kind of the same thing where you do certain types of exercises or stressors on your body, they cause inflammation, but then the response is, you know, more anti-inflammatories. Like I could see the same correlation with thoughts in your your mind that you kind of maybe need to have that abrasion there to uh to build up the other side exactly exactly yeah that's a real good way of putting it what book has been most influential on your life and why so again this is a very uh interesting question because you know the, the name of the book that i'm going to give you is was a book that i just read um last year and it's called 12 rules for life by jordan peterson so, um, you know, every single rule in this book, uh, I think is absolutely incredible. Um, but it's a book that 
like you don't you don't read 12 rules for life you study it you know you study it every day you go back and look over it like i've been through it you know a couple times um really really carefully but then i'm also just going back through some of the chapters and just highlighting stuff and and um and just trying to literally just just think about it you know it's one of those books where you know almost every single uh, sentence is like could be you know one of these like strong like memes that you might see on your Instagram or Twitter or whatever um, that you can almost just have to like sit down and think about like the, the entire book is like that so it's not something to be read it's something to be studied um, but you know again like Jordan speaks to a lot of the things that that I, I, I talk about you know discipline and self sacrifice and you know he does say in the book that you know you are going to have to contend with malevolence out there and that um, um, you know, human beings have always been malevolent and we're going to have to accept that. And, you know, there, there's ways where you, uh, you can kind of, you know, figure out, you know, if you are being manipulated or if someone is being malevolent towards you and recognize those ways. And I talk about that too, a lot with, um, you know, mental health because, you know, a lot of uh, mental health is, is people just, you know, being manipulate and being backed into corners and then being put in really, you know, difficult situations. When they're in those difficult situations, you know, they get very depressed um, and they feel that there's no way out and, and they can't, and they can't get out of it. So, you know, in addition to, you know, upgrading their, you know, biochemical uh, physiology, I think that we also need to look at upgrading their psychology, make them, you know, make, uh, you know, be more astute about people who may, may in fact not have their best interest in mind. What daily habits or rituals do you have? So I'm really big on having a morning routine. I think that, you know, if you can own that first hour of the day, then you can own your day. Whereas like if you get off to a bad start, then it's really hard to pick up that momentum. And, you know, there's a lot of research behind this too. I mean, if you do one thing, you know, you get this dopamine kick and then all of a sudden you want to do the next thing. You know, if you have a journal and there's 10 things on it, you know, if you cross off the first thing, it's a lot easier to do the second thing. But if you don't get that first thing done, you're not going to want to do the second thing. Um, but, you know, just getting back to, to my morning routine, you know, I think that it's really important to put yourself in a really good state at the beginning of the day, you know, make sure that, uh, that your, that your mind is ready and set to you know, do your best work. Because if your mind isn't ready and set, it doesn't matter how smart you are, what knowledge you have, um, you're not going to be able to put your best work out there. You have to be in a good physiological, psychological state in order to be able to do your job and, and help other people. So, um, you know, the main things that I do is I always do five minutes or 10 minutes of gratefulness journaling. So I do that in the five minute journal. Um, and that's just, you know, a really great habit and exercise that I do because, you know, the things that happened yesterday, um, you know, I may not be grateful for today or I may, you know, take an extra second, you know, the next day to, to realize just how happy that made me. And it might just be, you know, a real simple, simple text, you know, like, for example, one of my friends from Newfoundland uh, yesterday, you know, we're both real big Eminem fans. We have been a whole life. Um, you know, he just sent me this one, one line from one of his lyrics and one of his uh, most recent songs, you know. And as soon as I saw that, I smiled. It made me laugh. And it's because it was one of, one of my favorite lyrics, too. And, you know, that's something that I write in my gratefulness journal. So, you know, being able to be grateful for those small things is just so, so important. So I write my gratefulness journal every single day. The other thing I do um, is I read from the Daily Stoic. So I do try and try and try to practice stoicism daily. So, you know, stoicism is basically just this ancient philosophy or beliefs about um, trying to control the things that you can control and then not worrying about the things that you can't. Of course, it's you know, so much easier said than done. I know that. Um, but, you know, that's why it has to be practiced every single day. You're not going to become a stoic overnight. You know, you're not going to become a stoic maybe in a year. It's going to take years and years, and you're still going to have days where you're not going to feel like you're very stoic. Um, but the more and more you do, you know, the, the better you'll get and the more stoic that you'll become. So that's the second thing I do. Um, and the third thing that I always do as well is 10 minutes of uh, heart rate variability training. So it's basically my form of, of meditation. And, uh, you know, I find that those three things together are really effective for kind of, you know, set me off and, and uh, in, a, in a real great mindset so I can, you know, be helpful to other people. Do you, does this uh, kind of trail into sleep? Do you have, does your ritual kind of start at like a certain time you make sure you go to bed? 
So, yeah, I mean, one of the big things that I tell people, you know, coming back to, you know, it seems like we're talking a lot about mental health is like, you have to go to bed and get up at the same time every day, you know, um, especially on the days that you work. So yes, you know, on, on the days that I work, I, I go to bed at 930 every night, I wake up at 530 every morning, you know, um, on the days that I don't work, you know, sometimes I get up a little bit later, 630, sometimes even 730. If, if I have the time, but generally speaking, you know, those are the, the, uh, the regimens that, that I stick to. Um, and I find that to be, you know, really, really effective. And I think that that's something that everyone should do, you know, having structure and routine in your life can really help, uh, your mental health and really help your overall productivity and well-being. Yeah. I, uh, I forget the doctor's name, but there was a sleep specialist that was on Joe Rogan talking that you can have like a 30% decrease in physical ability if you don't get a proper night's sleep so the idea that yeah. fighters going out there into a match that if they don't sleep well because they're nervous the night before there's huge physiological effects on what they can actually do which if you're doing that every day that's got to cascade into your immune system your health depression yeah i think it was dr dr walker what was his name and yeah he's absolutely right um you know our uh, circadian rhythm is you know is highly linked to you know eating our mental health um, you know, everything really. So, you know, going to bed and getting up at the same time every day, if you are struggling, you know, that's something that you need to build in. And I say this to people too, you know, so people say, you know, I can't get up, you know, five, five 30 in the morning, um, you know, because I just find it to be too early, but you might have to go through a day or two where you feel like absolutely terrible and then to get on that routine you know so don't think that you know it's going to be easy to get on that routine um just know that oh when you do get there it's it's going to be a lot easier to keep the momentum going yeah it but makes sense it's almost like lack it's like a forced uh, jet lag yeah yeah exactly exactly you know the initiation part is always difficult in anything you know we talk about exercise you know starting off an exercise routine i mean it's so hard but i mean after a while once you do it it becomes like brushing your teeth you know you just kind of do it without even thinking about it or realizing it now if i were to ask your best friend what is one thing they would say you need to work on the most and why okay <laughs> i think i know what it is um i'm not as good as I should be sometimes at getting back to people. Uh, I think that my friends would say that I'm probably the worst texter in the world. <laughs> um, so, you know, how, how do I justify that? You know, right now I'm just in a period of my life where I'm, you know, extremely uh, busy. So, so because of that, you know, it is difficult to, um, you know, get back to people sometime. But, you know, on that note, like one lesson that, that I've learned from that is that, you know, if you do, you know, you always want to help the people that you love. And if you can't find time to do that, then, you know, you're going to feel guilty and you're not going to feel well, well yourself. Um, so, you know, through that, um, you know, I have kind of learned that always make sure that you have time uh, for the people that you love and, and for the people that have been good to you because it's so important to, to give back to those who have who've been good to you. But at the same time, you know, you do need to, to protect your own time. And the other thing is that if you can't help yourself, you're not going to be able to help other people. Like the reason I can help other people and have these discussions and things like this is because, you know, I do say no to a lot of, of, of things. And because I say no, you know, that gives me time to read, to think, to write, um, you know, to do podcasts like this and, and help other people. So you do have to find that balance, but, um, you know, it is a balance. So you always have to make sure that you have time to, to help. Uh, yeah, and that, that, that's a weird flip side. Cause you know, on the flip, if you were to spend more time responding to people that were close to you, you'd have less time to spend in your practice, helping people change their lives. So yeah, it's, it's like you said, it's all about trying to find that balance. Yes. And, and you know what, there's no magic balance to that. Like that's a struggle I'm going to have for the rest of my life. And I understand that, you know, that's, that's no big deal. That's just part of life. What are you most curious about? I think what I'm most curious about is why people make certain decisions and why certain people become successful and, and content and, and why others don't. You know, I'm very, very interested in that. Um, and that's really what I've dedicated, you know, most of my work and most of my life to in, in many regards. 
So, you know, it really comes down to, I think, upgrading their physiology and upgrading their psychology. And, you know, I think also, too, there's a big genetic component in it as well. You know, a lot of people are just more curious by nature. You know, that, that's, that's just the way they are. And some people just aren't, aren't curious as well. Um, so I'm very, very interested in, in motivation and why certain people become motivated and why certain people do not become motivated. And I think that, you know, both of those things are highly correlated to physiology and, and highly correlated to psychology. Um, and you need to be upgrading both constantly all the time if you want to be at the top of your game. You know, it can't just be one. It's got to be both. Yeah. I, I mean, I keep bouncing back to this idea, but there's correlations between gut health and mental health. And yeah. it, it goes both ways. You know, what you're putting into your body, how you're exercising, your mental thoughts, it's a bounce back between. So like, it, that's why I find I'm, I'm I didn't even think about this. You're basically saying, hey, you know, here's this positive effect in, you have people that have this characteristic and those people tend to be healthier, tend to be more energetic, tend to take care of themselves, help others around them. And so you go, well, how do we, do we reach that? And that's a really, that's a really cool, cool um, angle. Yeah. Well, like, like I said, I mean, I don't have it figured out or mastered. You know, I just have some, some principles that I think will help. Um, but it's, it's going to be a balancing act for the rest of my life because the, the, you know, it's, it's a good thing, but in all, also it's a problem is like, because I'm so curious, like I want to learn about so many different things. Um, and because I want to learn about so many different things, I mean, that's going to take up even more of my time. Um, so, you know, I just have to be really careful about, you know, almost becoming too curious at times, making sure that I still have that, that time to kind of, you know, um, you know, like help and, and take care of the people that I love. What was the most embarrassing experience of your life? Well, I've had many of them, so, uh, I can answer this question all day, but, uh, I mean, I still, uh, you know, I mean, I think there was one time, even a couple of years ago, it might've been three years ago now that like, even sometimes when I do the, the speeches with cannabis, um, you know, I'll build things up in my head where like, this is going to be, you know, the greatest thing ever. I'm, like I'm delivering all this information that's going to, you know, really change the minds of so many people. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of things are going to happen as a consequence of the speech. And then I'll go there. And then, you know, as soon as I get into the speech, it's very, very obvious that, you know, it's basically uh, put up there so that other people could more or less, um, you know, ask me really difficult questions or questions that, you know, are basically just trying to make me look bad, make the cannabis industry look bad, uh, you know, make the people that I work with look bad, everything. So, you know, that's always really, really disappointing and really embarrassing when you're, you know, up on stage in front of, you know, hundreds of people um, and, and they're out and there's cameras on you and all this type of stuff. And then you basically just kind of like bomb, you know, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, um, the bombing may be due to, um, you know, someone uh, in, in the audience, maybe, you know, asking me some, you know, difficult questions leading to other people asking um, and when I mean difficult questions, I don't mean difficult in the fact of like, you know, academic questions that I can't answer. I just mean like difficult in the fact of like, you know, um, uh, questions that would just try to like induce like an emotional response to me so that they can make, you know, themselves look better and me not look good type of thing. Um, so those are always embarrassing and difficult situations. Um, you know, luckily I haven't had, you know, that happen in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, like a lot of people in the cannabis industry seem to be, um, you know, a lot more positive about things uh, now. And, you know, the stigma I feel is starting to, to dissipate a little, a little bit, even though it does still exist. Um, but, you know, I'm always, you know, uh, leery about that and, you know, it could happen again. And if it happens again, you know, so be it. I'm, I'm here to, to do that and, and take that. That's okay. That's awesome. You're not speaking to those people anyways. Those people have already made up your minds. There's that one person in the audience that you're speaking to. So, well, maybe that tale's nice. Uh, what is your greatest fear? My greatest fear would be working a job that I don't like or, you know, like working for the man, so to speak. 
Um, like I'm 34 years old. I still don't even own a suit. I'm just not that kind of guy. Um, you know, I don't uh, prescribe pharmaceuticals that I that I don't believe in. You know, the reason I got into the cannabis industry is because I truly believe in the medicine. So, you know, I have a job where I go to work, like I take my dog in, into my work with me. You know, I'm not wearing a suit. Uh, the girls in the office that work with me, they take uh, their, their dog in and you know, we even have a parrot in there. So, you know, we have a lot of fun in, in our office. It's a real cool culture. Um, and, you know, I'm just so glad that I'm not caught up in that corporate world, you know, wearing suits, trying to impress people that I like don't even like um, playing like power games and all that type of crap. Like I just, I, that's just not for me. You know, I'm just all about the, the academics and, and trying to build something and, and help as many people as I possibly can. And I feel that at our clinic, you know, a lot of people when they come in, they're really surprised because we have like oil diffusers going in the front. You know, we got the dog there like running up and grabbing people. We got all these stoic quotes all over the wall. Um, you know, it's just, it's just not your typical clinic. And I'm so happy that, that it is that way. No, the, the, what's beautiful to me is you see a correlation between a person's mental health and their immune system. So, you know, when the big hospitals turn into this depressing place that nobody wants to go that, you know, you just, you have this feeling when you're creating the opposite through you know, doing things the fun way, you know, the, 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 you know, focusing on the patient, not, you know, these made up words and rules going, Hey, how do we actually fix these people? And then, you know, out of that, you get this wonderful healing environment. That's, that's really good to hear. Yeah. I think that the, the environment that we create is healing um, in itself. And, and sorry, I didn't mean to um, kind of uh, brush past the, uh, the uh, gut health uh, that you mentioned earlier. So Yes, uh, what you mentioned is absolutely true. You know, um, your gut health is linked to both your mental health and your and your immune system. Seventy percent of your immune system you know, lies in your gut, um, so it's really important to take care of your gut. Um, like I put, you know, sauerkraut in my uh, in my shake today. You know, I often take a probiotic as well. You know, just to, just just to help um, even further. So, um, you know, I didn't mean to. Um, uh, brush, uh, brush that off. That's a really important point. You know, a lot of people have found tremendous benefit just by upgrading um, their, their gut health and translating that into upgrading their mental health. Yep. I love it because it bounces both ways. You know, you, you can start from so many points. You can start with just exercise. You can start with food. You can start with meditation and they all push on each other. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's building momentum. You know, like if you eat healthy, you're going to want to exercise. If you work out, you know, you're going to want to eat healthy. Like they're all correlated, right? Like if you work out, you're not going to want to go eat a bag of donuts. You're going to be like, okay, let's go get a, let's go get a post-workout shake and see what's up. You know, like that's the kind of attitude that you're going to have. What quality do you most admire in a man? I have to kind of give two, but they're both very related. Um, so one of them would be discipline. And the second one would be self-sacrifice in yourself. So, you know, discipline, I think, is incredibly important because, you know, like we already kind of talked about, um, if you don't have discipline, if you can't discipline yourself, you're not going to be able to discipline other people. And the other people aren't going to listen to you either. You know, like the, the reason why someone say like, you know, a Jocko Wilnick or Jordan Peterson or like Joe Rogan, like those guys, like the reason why people listen to them is because they're authentic and they're disciplined themselves, you know, and, and they know that. So, you know, if you want to help other people, like the best way to do it is by being a good example. You know, you don't, I mean, sure, you can help other people by, you know, giving them information like this. But I mean, the other thing is that you want to actually live it. And if you live it, I mean, that's going to be much, much more inspiring to other people. And, you know, I, you know, the people I mentioned, you know, Jocko, I think is extremely disciplined, you know, that's an, an understatement, I would say. Um, and, and because of that, you know, he's, he's able to help other people. That's why he's able to help other people is because he's disciplined. He knows what works and uh, all the people see that he's disciplined and that gives them inspiration. You know, if he was, if he wasn't taking those pictures for 30 in the morning every day, you know, people wouldn't see him as authentic and then he wouldn't be able to get his message across. So, you know, I think that uh, the discipline and self-sacrifice is really, really important. Yeah. It's amazing what uh, the outcome of that can be waking up. Yeah. At 
30 every morning and working your hardest turns into a following. And I mean, guys helped so many people turn around their lives just with this saying, Hey man, you can do it. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's a message that like, you know, people don't have and, and like a lot of like, you know, you know, men and women, but a lot of, you know, men in particular, are just like starving for this information, you know, and, um, myself and my friends were talking the other day, like a lot of, you know, women, they, they had a lot of role models growing up, like whether it was like, you know, Oprah Winfrey or Ellen or all the, you know, different, different women, but you know, a lot of men, they have not had like a lot of like role models to, to really look up to, you know, it's only in the, been in the past few years where I think we've had these like long discussions, you know, with uh, the, these podcasts, like the guys that we mentioned, like Logan and, and all these guys, you know, and then that's given, you know, I think, um, a lot of men like some uh, some information uh, that they really needed to hear, and I think that they're starving for it. Um, and I think that's why a lot of those guys are becoming, you know, so popular is uh, is is because you know they're giving out actionable information that's very helpful for people. Oh, Jordan Peterson, he's he's the litmus test on that. I mean, he's the 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 largest selling the best selling Canadian author I think he's the best selling self help author in the world right now he's touring yeah. and selling out and he's doing exactly what you said he's offering a very well thought out articulated thought I mean it took him like eight or twelve years or something to write his first book you know he he's the point is you know he's put a lot of time into this so yeah yeah it's been a vacuum that men have not had this this person to look up to, to follow, to have a certain honesty, you know, especially in this uh, demasculating world. If you don't have those role models, you know, it, it's got to be confusing for kids nowadays. And I mean, I don't know if, if you saw Adam recently, the, uh, the American um, Psychological Association came out with, you know, traditional masculinity as a mental health disorder. Oh man! And you know, in that, in that definition, literally, you know, one of the first things in there was stoicism. And, you know, I just, I've talked about stoicism now a couple of times and we've only been chatting for, you know, 20 minutes or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, you know, I find stoicism just to be incredibly in, uh, effective. Like I, uh, I read from it every day. I've gifted, I think the daily stoic, um, you know, more than any other book that, that I've ever gifted for people. Um, and, you know, I do not think that it's, it's uh, that, that it causes anyone to be psychologically unstable um, in any regard at all. Um, so, you know, I think that that definitely needs to be removed from that, from that definitely. You just, I didn't even know that that's terrifying because you think about the study they did where they, they like took, um, they took this group of psychological students said, we want you to go check yourself into a mental hospital, say that you've been hearing voices, you know, for the last couple of days. And then immediately after you're checked in, act completely normal and then see how many people get pulled out and they're getting written up and not getting out of the system. And if you translate that to today, if you have something simple as stoicism, you know, a, a virtue that's, that's taught, that's, that's yeah. frightening. That <laughs> and, and what it is too, is like, it's, it's just breeding more into like entitlement. You know, the fact of like, like stoicism is, is all about, you know, doing what you can about the things that you can control and then not doing anything about the things that you can't control, you know? And, and again, I know that's very, very difficult to do, but with practice, you know, you do get better at it every single day. Um, but you know, if you, if you take that out of the, of the, uh, of the definition, um, you know, you still have other characteristics, like they said, um, I kind of forget all of them now, but, um, you know, aggression was in there and dominance and, you know, for sure there's times where aggression can work against you. And, you know, one of the, the quotes that, um, the front from stoicism is that, um, anger is not tough, it's weakness, you know, and that's for Marcus Aurelius. So like these guys like Seneca, um, and Marcus Aurelius, like they were not violent people, like at all, like these people who were trying, they were actually trying to bring peace to others. And, and they did. I mean, Marcus Aurelius is considered to be you know, the last good emperor of Rome. So, you know, to group, um, you know, stoicism, you know, with, with these other characteristics, I think is, uh, is, is, is really unnecessary. It's wrong. And also too, you know, some of the other characteristics are, are also necessary at times. Like I'm sure that, you know, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius 
use aggression in the proper form but you know you have to channel it in the right energy if you channel it in the wrong energy then you're going to do something wrong you might hurt someone if you channel it in the right energy and you put all that energy into say a really good workout then you're going to make yourself feel amazing and then that's going to inspire other people to go work out and also feel amazing. So, you know, I think that that definition is um, of, of traditional ma uh, masculinity needs to be re-examined. Yeah. If aggression is considered to be a mental health disorder, then if somebody's trying to hurt your family, protecting them makes you, you know, have a mental disease. That's, wow. Well, welcome to the world that we need to help people with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you need to push back and that's okay to tell people that. And like, you know, people, that's a message that people aren't being told these days, you know, who were your role models? <laughs> well, I think we already discussed a lot of them, but I'll, I'll name them again. Um, so, you know, Joe Rogan for, for sure. You know, I listened to a lot of, of his podcast, Jordan Peterson, uh, Jocko Wilnick, um, you know, those are probably the three guys, uh, Ryan Holiday. I really like his books. Um, actually he's probably writes my favorite. He's probably my favorite author would be, would be Ryan Holiday. So, you know, he has a book, the obstacle is the way. Um, and again, you know, that's the very stoic book. It's basically, uh, based upon Marcus's Aurelius quote, um, the impediment to action advances action, what stands in the way becomes the way. So, you know, when you have an obstacle, you see it as an opportunity to grow. You don't see it as, as something that's going to kind of um, like interfere with you because that's what everyone thinks these days. It's like when you have an obstacle, it's like, oh, this shouldn't be happening. You know, things should be different. And, and, that is that, and that's what makes people ha um, unhappy, right? So they get unhappy about being unhappy, you know, because they want their life to be different instead of just accepting it. And everyone knows, you know, the first step after acceptance is growth. It's like if you have an, an obstacle in your life, you know, just like complaining about it is going to do nothing to fix it. It's only going to make the problem grow worse and grow larger in your head. And you're just going to think about that all day. Whereas if you say, look at the obstacle, and you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this out and I'm going to find some way to get around it. Then you see that this something is, the, that that obstacle is there to teach you something. And then because it's taught you something, then you can actually get around the obstacle and you start building momentum. And then when the next obstacle comes, you don't get upset. You just think back. You know, the guy Maxwell Maltz uh, wrote a book on this called Psycho-Cybernetics. So like, you know, a lot of the times, and I use this all the time, like if I have a difficult situation, I just think back to a past difficult situation that I was in and then I somehow got over and got through. Um, and, you know, that's the way that we need to, to kind of look at things. But there's so many people these days, they're just so entitled and they think that everything has been given to, to all these people. And, you know, unfortunately, like social media makes this a lot worse because, you know, we're just inundated with all these you know, collections of people whose lives, you know, are going, you know, supposedly perfect, but we're really just seeing like their, their highlight reel. And they, they, and then they think that, you know, that should be me, you know, that should be me. And then that creates entitlement and that creates anger. But, you know, with the way you want to look at it is, you know, if you have an obstacle in front of you, 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 you don't look at it as something that is preventing you from getting to where you're going. You look at it as, okay, this is an opportunity to prove myself, to prove to other people. And then once I get around that, other people are going to see that, wow, man, that guy had something thrown at him and he got over it. And that's the people that other people respect. You know, like it's people who have, who have been through something, you know, they've, they've seen, they've had something happen to them. And then through that, the bad thing happened to them, they've learned from it and gotten through it and gotten over it. And that's the way to, to, to do it. And that's the way to get other people to respect you as well. You're never going to get any respect if you just, you know, complain about things. What institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? I think the biggest thing that needs to change, I mean, there's a couple of different things. We talked a lot about, you know, mental health and masculinity. So I'll kind of brush past that one. Um, I would say nutrition, you know, the nutrition information that's given out there for most people is terrible. Like, you know, the Canada's food guide and, you know, whatever the American version is like with whole, you know, promoting whole grains and all this stuff. Like it's, it's, it's brutal. 
You know, it's, it's terrible. It's literally like the worst thing that you can do. And people don't think that, you know, it's, it's insane how people don't think that what you eat doesn't affect your mental health. Like, obviously it makes a dramatic impact on how you feel. Every time you eat something, it's going to make you feel different. You know, you have to understand that. And, you know, there's so many people who try and I mean, even, you know, and I obviously love the guy like Jordan Peterson, but like even he went through a period of time where, you know, he didn't really look at his exercise and his, um, and his, uh, and, and his uh, diet, you know, it was, it's only been the past, you know, I think two or three years that he's really kind of re-examined that and he's noted all these like incredible changes. So, you know, don't feel that like, so, you know, if you are someone who has ignored it, you know, don't feel stupid about it because there's been, you know, incredibly intelligent people like Jordan Peterson who have made the same mistake. But when they have, you know, introduced a new diet, you know, they have been able to really overcome, you know, whatever mental health struggle they were having at that particular time. So I think that, you know, that's the, that's the institution that I would want to change is the nutritional information, you know, and put it out more as, well, first of all, telling people that, it has an impact. And then secondly, probably going more low carb and say high grains. Awesome. Yeah, I agree with that one. Because right there, you start changing people's minds, start changing mental health, start changing a lot of uh, the, oh, the base rules of society right now. Absolutely. What is the most courageous thing you have done or seen in your life? Okay. Um, so cr most courageous thing you know, I've done, I mean, a lot of people have told me, you know, particularly back in like early 2014, when I was the first uh, doctor in London to prescribe cannabis, um, you know, a lot of people thought it was, and I was only in my 20s at the time, I think I was only 29 when I started. Um, you know, people saw that as, as, as a very courageous act. Um, but, you know, I didn't really see it that way because, you know, to me, I just thought that if I didn't do this, you know, I'd just be a, a complete coward because, uh, or a complete hypocrite as well, because I knew that cannabis could help, you know, with a lot of things, particularly, you know, sleep and, and chronic pain um, and, you know, prescribing other medicines, you know, just would have made me feel terrible inside, you know, my soul would have just been dead. Um, so I think that, you know, prescribing cannabis um, was probably the most courageous thing that I've done in, 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 you know, back in 2014. Now, you know, a lot of people are doing it. So, and, and the word's kind of out there. So it's not so courageous, but, you know, back in 2014, when I was still in my 20s, um, you know, prescribing cannabis, I, I would say that would be the, the most courageous thing. Most courageous thing I've seen, for sure, it's my patients. Like, I have these patients and, like, they come in and, like, they have so many issues, like, like uh, really severe chronic pain. Um, you know, they've been through like so much trauma and some of them are still smiling, man. Like every single day they come in and, and they're still smiling. And, you know, I tell that to them, you know, it's some of them like that. I really, really admire them because I think like, man, like if I had all this happen to me, like, like would I still be as courageous as this person? Would I still be able to kind of keep going? You know, like, I don't know, but some of them, you know, they, they've had these horrible traumas, you know, especially some of the vets, you know, they, they've really been through hell, you know, they've really, really been through hell and, uh, and somehow, you know, they're still going and somehow like some of them, they're, they're, they're still, you know, disciplined and, 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 uh, and demonstrate a lot of self-sacrifice. They're still willing to help others. So, you know, to all my patients who are really, really struggling and, and keep going, you know, you absolutely, um, you know, push me and, and, and I admire that. Do you think the cannabis uh, ties back into what you said before about um, changing people's nutrition? Just the idea that you've got cannabinoid receptors throughout your body that maybe we've had a long history with this plant where it's more of like a, a nutrient or, you know, a, a food group than it is a drug? What I would say most is that a lot of people who try cannabis, especially people for the first time, they get, and not everyone, but a lot of people get just an incredible response. So a response they've never, ever gotten from other pharmaceuticals. So because of this, it opens up their whole mind because they're like, okay, if I've been lied to about pharmaceuticals, what else have I been lied to in, in about 
in regards to my health, in regards to nutrition, in regards to psychology, in regards to everything else. And then they start going down this other rabbit hole. So that's, and I, I wrote an, an article on this, you know, it's, it's in Medium, um, how, how cannabis can lead to a healthier lifestyle. And I've had so many patients who have, you know, said to me that once they started using the cannabis, they started exercising and they started, you know, doing other things. And then the other thing, other part about that is, you know, not to get too much into the pharmacological aspects of it, but, you know, a lot of people have trouble exercising because they have a lot of fear. You know, and one thing CBD oil has been shown to do, and it's been shown to do it through three different mechanisms of action, is that it decreases learned fear. So because they have less fear, you know, they're able to go to like public gyms. You know, they're able to, to go outside their home. Because, you know, when I talk about fear, like the people that I see in my office, I mean, some of these people don't leave their home like at all. Like, I mean, like zero times in a month. Right. And then there's other people who leave like five to 10 times a month. So, so to get these people just out of their house is a huge, huge task. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the, the people, not that you can't do home workouts at home, of course you can, but you know, a lot of workouts do, you know, go outside and, and at the gym and all that type of stuff. And, you know, there's also the camaraderie aspect of, you know, being on a team, being on a committee, you know, meeting people at the gym, whatever it is. So, you know, to get kind of the whole gamut of it, um, you know, it is better to, to leave your home sometimes and CBD oil can really help people with that. Well, this is uh, maybe another nice one to go into. What rule do you have for yourself that you would never break? And why do you think that it's important? So the one rule that I never break is, um, you know, I go to the gym or I work out at least six times a week. Um, you know, most, a lot of times it's seven. Um, and I'll never ever break it because every single day that I work out, I feel better than on the days that I don't work out. And that's why, you know, I work out six to seven days a week, as to say, opposed like three or four or five, because, you know, every single day that I do it, I feel better. So, you know, it's, it's a real basic philosophy of just fill up your day with doing stuff that you love. Right. So I love working out. It's so I, every single day I make a habit of doing it and I feel that that gives me a lot of momentum in other areas of my life. Um, so, you know, that's probably the biggest habit. And then the other thing too, is, you know, now that, you know, um, some people are, you know, following me, I do want to, you know, show other people that I am authentic and that I do practice what I preach. Um, and, and I hope that that motivates other people. That's awesome. No, that's awesome. That's exactly why it's great to see, you know, the Dwayne Johnson's, the, you know, the Jockos, the Wim Hoffs when they're, they're posting what they can do because, you know, I, I think back to, um, the, the world record, um, for like the eight minute mile. And as soon as it was broken, all of a sudden, boom, everybody's breaking this one record. And, you know, I just see it as being the same It's when you know, somebody else can do something. Well, yeah. Of course I can do it because they, yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. When you see another human being doing it, you know, you know that you can, you can do it. And that's why too, I appreciate all, all these guys. Like, you know, I forgot to mention David Goggins. He's one of the big guys that I look up to too. But I mean, there are humans that have done, like, I know it sounds insane, but there are people who've done like 200 mile runs. Like they, they've, they've done it, you know? So, you know, that to me shows that, you know, we don't really know what our potential is. Um, and most of us have so much more potential in us that, that we're living up to. And I think that is something to, you know, not to get off topic that really gives people a lot of like existential angst is like, if you are not living up to you, to, to your potential, you know, it's going to bother you. And if you, the, when you think about it, it's definitely going to bother you. But I think that even when you're not thinking about it, it's creeping in your, in your subconscious, you know, living up to your potential is so important. And if you don't do it, it is going to come back after you. Nice. Need to move the goalpost. Yeah. What does it mean to be a man in today's world? I think that what it means is to just simply do the right thing and to also be loyal to the truth. So, you know, someone who is going to do the right thing and loyal to the truth, you know, comes down to a scenario like this. When you're given 
an opportunity and it's going to benefit you, but it might hurt someone else. You say no. You, you, you decline the opportunity. You know, that's what a man does. And that's what a good woman does too, right? They stay loyal to the truth. They always do the right thing. Even if it's going to hurt them, they always make sure that they do the right thing. And that's what loyalty is. You know, when someone presents you with an opportunity and in that opportunity, you can, you can benefit, but you also, you know, in that regard, you're going to hurt someone else. You say no. And, and you figure out a way where that, you know, you can make the opportunity beneficial for everyone and you, and you do the right thing. And that's the most important thing that we need to, you know, tell people in, in today's society, because it's all about, you know, getting ahead and getting ahead, you know, and, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, it's just way too much promotion about, you know, the, 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 the individual, you know, and we need to make sure that other people understand that you're going to find meaning when you help other people. And if you do the wrong thing, you are going to have so much anxiety. You're going to have so much angst. You're not going to be able to sleep at night. But if you know that you did the right thing, then you're not going to have that, that angst. You're going to feel so much less anxious. You're going to feel so much more content. You're going to be able to sleep at night. Um, and, and you're going to feel better about yourself. And other people are going are to respect that. Because if you, you know, keep doing the wrong thing, you're going to build a bad reputation and it's going to be a hard hole for you to get out of. I love it. Sleep better at night because you do the right thing, which means your health gets better, which means you can improve your mental thought and then you can go on to help more people. Very nicely put. Very nicely put. Well, Mike, those were great answers. Uh, That's the end of our initial 14 questions on 13 questions. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming or everybody for you for coming on and sharing your experiences with everybody. Um, everybody should go to mantranscending.com, become a member, get access to the premium podcast courses, writing exercises. And of course you'll have access to the bonus questions, which are coming up right now. Thank you guys for joining us. All right. Welcome back for the bonus round, Mike. It's only been 30 seconds. How you doing? (laughs) Good. How are you doing? (laughs) Good. All right, so the first question on our bonus is, what quality do you most admire in a man? I don't want no word no. I don't want no word no. Yo, what? I don't want no word no. Why's one man rich and another man poor? Why we ain't satisfied? Why we gotta have your suicide rates on the rest so high Why I tell you the truth but you say don't lie Why is being a good father at an all time low Why is it acceptable, yo, why I don't know Why she blame him and he blame her, it's useless Ask yourself this question, why you making excuses Why do parents gotta bury their kids Why we text and drive, not caring how scary it is Why it's so hard to forgive and leave the past behind And if you did, then that's divine Why don't you help your brother when you see him fall? Why do we act like God don't see it all? Why do we call them black, them white, them Asians and use labels? Now that's racism. I don't want no way, no. Why? 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 I don't want no way, no. Why is there innocent people locked up for life? Why some people can't say nothing nice? Why do we always gotta question what all of it means? And why won't you follow your dreams? Tell 
me why The night when you took my dad Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry And tell me why And why did you choose to hide Even though you was born to fly And tell me why And why don't we turn from all the hate And why don't we learn from all mistakes Why do I keep on wrecking these fat beats And teachers don't make more than professional athletes And why This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.